So, let's continue. Uh, thank you for being back. You are kind of full of energy still, I have the impression. So, but still, dinner is an hour away, so I have to, to keep that. Um, this is just what I said so far, the classical idea that with uh, consolidation or systems level consolidation, the memories get hippocampally independent. This view was challenged um, uh, by evidence, mainly by this uh, paper from Bontempi, published already in 1999. Uh, in, in rats doing this kind of deadly pet. Uh, what they did, they uh, trained animals and uh, then they um, uh, killed them either directly or later. And uh, then you, they can, you can measure the activity during retrieval. So first learning, retrieval, then killing. Killing was always immediately after. The only difference was the delay between study and test. Sorry. So if, you, if there was just a short delay between um, the uh, study and test, what you can see is heightened activity, for example, in the hippocampus. Uh, but if you go to the remote, there is less activity in the hippocampus, uh, but uh, you have more activity in neocortical areas, and in particular, as they call it, the anterior singlet cortex. I would say medial prefrontal cortex. Um, and uh, by that, they kind of um, adapted the classical system level consolidation model. Instead of just saying the memory is less dependent on the hippocampus, they added a new module, the medial prefrontal cortex or the uh, dorsal ACC, uh, that is relevant for remote memory retrieval in cases when the hippocampus is not longer involved in retrieval. Along with that idea, we conducted a study in humans uh, actually, uh, Atsuko Takashima, a uh, postdoc in my lab at that time, uh, did a quite uh, brave study because uh, she asked uh, the participants to learn on the first day a set of 320 pictures, real world photographs, nice pictures, beaches, houses, mountains, whatever. And then they allowed the subjects to uh, sleep, to take kind of a siesta, and then they had to learn another set of new 80 pictures. And then they went into the scanner for the first time. And during, while being in the scanner, they did a recognition memory test in which we intermixed uh, 80 remote items, 80 of those, 80 recent, those 80 that were just learned, and 80 new ones. And it was just an old new recognition memory task uh, with a confidence rating. And we are only taking into account for our analysis the high confident uh, uh, retrieved items. On day two, she repeated that sequence again, 80 new pictures to be learned prior to going to the scanner. And then inside the scanner, the subject saw 80 remote, 80 of those, 80 recent, and 80 new. Same procedure on day 30 and day 90. So over the course of three months, the subjects learned prior to scanning always 80 pictures, recent memory, always new items, just once learned, and they retrieved items that got progressively more remote because these 80 remote are always different 80 remotes, four times 80, 320. So we have during retrieval two sets of items, or three, the new ones, the recent ones, and the remote ones. If you just look uh, whether initially the hippocampus is involved in that task, yes it is. You see that the hippocampus is more active for hits and misses uh, that were just learned prior to the encoding on day one. I told you we asked the subject to take a siesta. Slow wave sleep is difficult, but we got it, or at least some. You see that a substantial number of uh, subjects did not reach, deep, uh, de reach any sleep. They just stayed awake, couldn't sleep. But some could sleep up to five, 50 minutes in a two-hour break, in slow wave sleep only. So. You have to sleep immediately to get that. Huh? And the nice thing is, if you look into performance, recognition performance, um, on the, the, uh, the duration of slow wave sleep and the ability to remember items, either items you have learned just prior to sleep or uh, thereafter. And the prior to sleep are the remote ones. And you see there's a positive correlation. So those subjects that slept the longest benefited the most from this break. 
in terms of items learned prior to sleep. But they were not just more awake afterwards because the items that they learned after the nap had no effect. In general, it was a bit better, but uh, there was no relation. Indicating that this sleep effect on memory is an active process um, and, and not a passive one. Um, and uh, this increase in activity uh, related to performance was also related to an activity increase across subjects in the hippocampus during this initial sleep. If you now look into the activity uh, during retrieval, just a confident hits for remote or recent, and you look for an, uh, an, an, a development, a nonlinear development of the effect over the course of three months, you can nicely see that um, the, uh, there's one brain region where the activity goes down and there's only one region where activity goes up over the three months. One is in the hippocampus, fits nicely with the classical uh, consolidation theory that with time you need your hippocampus for retrieval less. The other is a very ventral uh, medial prefrontal uh, region that shows heightened activity with um, the uh, retrieval of progressively more remote items. Testing that further, we did this face location association task I mentioned already shortly. Uh, then we did it a bit simpler because the main effect was already in the first day Why working for uh, three months and losing subjects over the course. Um, we uh, uh, did that uh, on, on just one day and again a remote set, a recent set and then the cured recall in the scanner. And uh, this time we um, uh, did um, again the activity tested during retrieval and what you see is there is less activity in the very posterior part of the hippocampus and if you put a seed region in that and look into decreased activity due to the remoteness then you see inferior temporal including fusiform and um, uh, parietal regions uh, rele uh, relevant for uh, phase location associations. So the neocortical network gets stronger and the hippocampal, uh, no, that gets, gets weaker. The hippocampal pointer function to that gets uh, uh, weaker. Increased activity in the fusiform and some other ne uh, neocortical areas. And if you put the seed in the fusiform, you see that the connectivity increases with remoteness to more earlier visual areas and the parietal area representing phase location associations. So classical consolidation theory confirmed in the sense that with time or sleep or the combination of both, you see less hippocampal involvement in activity and connectivity and more neocortical. Where's the medial prefrontal cortex? You didn't get it. I was disappointed. That's the way it is. No clue why. Um, going on. So this was um, nevertheless, I would like to, to, to stick to the medial prefrontal and in align with, with Paul Frankel and Bontempi, uh, I would like to, to propose and further support in the upcoming studies that with consolidation uh, you have more uh, medial prefrontal in involvement and I would like to describe the function of medial prefrontal cortex in memory better in these experiments. With all the studies I have shown you so far, the main complaint we got when we discussed these papers or uh, studies is that remote is of course more difficult and if it's more difficult then uh, the decisions are harder to make and therefore you get the medial prefrontal cortex. So we were looking for a paradigm where consolidated memories are actually easier to retrieve. And when we were thinking about that uh, we were lucky because Richard Morris just published a paper in Science at that time where he showed that uh, the interaction between pre-existing mental schemas or knowledge structures and new encoding enables the rat to encode uh, new information and new peer as they call it, uh, faster. So as soon as you can link information to your pre-existing knowledge, the better you can encode new information related to that. And in particular, the consolidation gets faster because the rats show hippocampal independent memory already after 24 hours. 
if the new information is linked to pre-existing knowledge of the rat. This was quite a remarkable uh, study because it was kind of, the, I think, the first attempt in neuroscience to look into that effect. Although the idea of schema in memory is quite an old one. Here is a quote from Bartlett uh, from 1932. A schema is a structure that people use to organize current knowledge and provide a framework for future understanding. But uh, schema theory in memory was kind of dead for many decades and nobody looked at that. Actually, all the studies I presented you so far, and it's not only my studies, I think almost the entire field ignored the fact that the brain is not a tabula rasa and new memories are just placed there on the white spot and you add that uh, memory to, to that uh, empty space. No, all memories are of course interacting with uh, already existing knowledge structures. So we went into that and we were interested whether we now can have an effect where the memory for consolidated items is actually better and therefore we would be able to counteract the idea that our remote recent consolidation effect is just a difficulty. How did we do that? So Malike van Kistelen, an excellent PhD student in my group, uh, did that study. And in that study, the subject had to learn triplets of uh, items. A word written of an object made out of fabric. Without watching, they had to feel different types of fabrics and they saw a pattern uh, that the fabric might look like. And these triplets were organized in a way that half of them were congruent with your expectancy based on your world knowledge, and half of them were non uh, uh, you didn't expect. For example, if you, uh, and th this expectancy or this congruency was only based on the link between the word and the fabric, because the pattern, almost everything is possible nowadays. Eh? Uh, there you can't have clear-cut, uh, uh, impossible combinations. Might be some odd ones, but still, uh, nothing is impossible. But, uh, for example, a leather umbrella would be something very strange and unexpected. As you can see, the item recognition or the assertive retrieval is better for the congruent than the incongruent items. So indicating, indeed, that uh, the memory for the congruent is better. And uh, during retrieval, the activity in uh, the uh, myopifrontal cortex is stronger from congruent than the incongruent, also in an area in the sensory cortex. This is a region of interest we defined functionally in each individual. And the connectivity between this myopifrontal cortex uh, area and the sensory cortex, where you have the information about the fabric, is increased from congruent and incongruent during successful retrieval. So that's an interaction effect between memory, success, and uh, uh, congruency. So, bless you. Um, in addition, the connect this connectivity strength um, across subject was positively correlated to uh, the um, uh, uh, benefit uh, in schema memory. So, um, uh, showing that uh, the retrieval already um, after these are 24 hours shows this involvement of the MEOP frontal cortex. Thereafter, we were interested actually in the red. It looked like that the schema effect is only visible during consolidation but uh, we thought it should also have already an effect on encoding. Based on that, we looked, for example, on that paper by Dashan Kumaran and Alan McGuire's group, and they tracked very elegantly the emergence of conceptual knowledge in a very simple task. The task is so-called um, uh, uh, weather prediction task. It's a very rule-based, rule very simple concept. The task is they use these fractals and they have two different rules, spatial and non-spatial. And the spatial says if uh, this uh, item is left of that, it's sunshine. If it's on the right, it's rain. If it's on the left here again, it's, uh, it's rain. And if it's on the right, it is uh, uh, rain. A non-spatial condition is always just the combination. It doesn't matter in which location they are placed that predicts either sunshine or rain. The individuals just learn that by trial and error. 
And they showed already that the accumulation of this simple rule-based memory is uh, associated with activity in this medial prefrontal uh, area. We used even a further simplified version of that. We didn't use fractals. Uh, we used just uh, colored circles and uh, the same thing. So in the spatial rule, this one predicts sun, this rain, the sun, this rain, depending on the location of the yellow, or the non-spatial, uh, the combination of yellow and red is sun, and the combination of yellow and blue, or just blue, is rain. If we acquire activity while they do the test on these items, and we used uh, by purpose these items because we are interested in multivariate uh, pattern classification, we found the following. We found that the connectivity of the medial prefrontal cortex to the angular gyrus was actually um, increased uh, with uh, congruent as opposed to incongruent items. Uh, also, the posterior singlet cortex connectivity to that area increased to the angular gyrus, and uh, the angular gyrus connectivity just more or less the reverse um, test showed the same regions. And then we did, uh, actually, Isabella Wagner, an Austrian uh, PhD student now working as a postdoc in Wien Vienna, um, uh, did that study. Uh, she uh, analyzed then, um, uh, um, she trained a pattern classifier and uh, first checked just the visual, low level visual input without ignoring the rule. And as you can see in green, all the visual cortex, uh, the activity in that area, the pattern of activity in that area enables uh, the computer to distinguish uh, the different uh, visual input the subject had. If she tested for the um, uh, the, the different rules, where in the brain the different rules can be separated based on the uh, pattern of activity. She found an area in the angular gyrus, close to that star here, that's just showing that this is always the same uh, spot, that overlaps uh, with the green area. So uh, the uh, conclusion from that study is that actually the integration of the low-level visual information and the conceptual information in the rules is actually integrated in the angular gyrus and which is closely connected to the prefrontal cortex during retrieval of these consolidated uh, memories. But we would be also interested in the encoding, I told you. So we did, uh, Malika van Kisteren did two very nice uh, real-world <coughs> encoding studies where we actually looked into the, uh, the schema effect. One was just kind of an association between scenes and objects. And as you can see, a rainy street, an umbrella fits nice, a bedroom, an umbrella fits less nice. So you can easily con construct uh, congruent and incongruent items, uh, pairs. The other study was more laborious. She invited students at the end of the first study year for an fMRI experiment. And two types of students, either biology students or pedagogic students, so students that train to become teacher. And she constructed, with the help of the people from the curriculum development in these courses, new facts that the students have not learned yet, but they have the conceptual knowledge. For example, they know what an excitatory neurotransmitter, or that what a neurotransmitter is, but they didn't learn yet uh, that glutamate is the main excitatory uh, neurotransmitter. And in that way, we were able to present um, those students, both biology and pedagogic students, a set of new facts they should learn that belonged either to their own field or to the field of the other fellow students of the other field. In that way, they were learning information that was either congruent with their prior knowledge or not. All this, the, the items we tested that uh, post hoc that they were actually aware of, so the real good students, of course, knew more, uh, these items were all removed from the analysis. Only these, those that they didn't know before the answer. And then we tested the memory thereafter. And in both of these studies, we got very overlapping results. As you can see here, we looked into a uh, simple interaction between the subsequent memory effect, difference between later remembered and forgotten, 
and the congruency effect, congruent versus incongruent, which brain areas shown interaction. And as you can see here, there is a stronger subsequent memory effect for schema congruent encoding in the medial prefrontal cortex and more posterior medial regions in both studies, and a stronger uh, medial temporal lobe <coughs> subsequent memory effect for the schema incongruent novel information to be learned. Moreover, if we extract the data from, from this little boy uh, individually uh, from each subject and regress that against uh, the um, performance in terms of average grades of the student, we can see the better or the larger the subsequent memory effect was, the better the uh, uh, average grade in the second year was. So the ability to in integrate new information that fits your pre-existing knowledge uh, with the help of the medial prefrontal cortex enables you to perform better uh, in uh, the second year. Mm. If, what about the uh, grades in the first year? Maybe they didn't learn? This was uh, normalized by the first year. It's just uh, the, the improvement. This was, these were two kind of real-world studies. We were interested also to formalize it more. And uh, we um, used an, an artificial uh, uh, language that was uh, developed by Kirby et al., actually by their subjects, because uh, they have uh, let subjects structure in an iterative process over several generations um, syllables into meaningful um, uh, concepts. And uh, so this is an, a natural, as they call it, an evolution in a laboratory of a structured um, uh, language. And the language is very simple. I will explain in the next slide. We presented a moving simple object and uh, the subject had to learn how these objects were named. And there was a clear structure, at least for half of this uh, object. So the color was associated with the first syllable, so knee for red. The square was, or the, the, the shape was associated with the second syllable, so for a square, za. And the, and the direction of the movement was associated uh, with the third syllable, so a rightward, horizontal rightward movement with za. So this red square is knee, za, za. And in this way, you can create hundreds of letters. And uh, you can also distinguish between regular and irregular ones. Because here, there's not a one-to-one -one association, and therefore you're unable to learn a systematic there. In this way, over the course of several learning trials, the subjects were able to, um, to learn that language. Ruth Berger is a PhD student in my group that is now a postdoc in the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig, uh, did that study. And uh, as you can see here, it's kind of a more detailed uh, description of the, uh, this, the way. So they learn the first set of items, a few hundred, second, and they're quite good in learning that. As you can see here, uh, in the regular condition, uh, they reach uh, after eight learning blocks within the scanner. Uh, so within an hour, they, without, uh, they get kind of 80% correct with feedback. And uh, the irregular, of course, impossible to do, they don't learn anything. And then we used a computational model uh, with the help of, of uh, David Neville, a postdoc in the group, um, uh, the very simple one, state-space model, uh, that um, assesses the um, uh, accumulation of knowledge over the course uh, of, of the learning based on the uh, actual uh, learning trials. And uh, then you get kind of a mean uh, learning uh, curve for um, the, uh, the group. And then you can use that curve to analyze which brain region is showing that temporal behavior in an individual level. These curves are, of course, quite different between individuals. Um, so per individual uh, at the first level, we uh, and used their space, uh, state space uh, model to use as input for the fMRI analysis. And thereby we see several regions, the neocortex important, medial prefrontal of course, angular gyrus, all the regions I like to see. 
not the hippocampus. Of course, in the individual curve, it's not that smooth, of course, the individual one, because there are sometimes steep learning events where people are uh, kind of increasing their knowledge uh, in a stepwise fashion. Um, you can also derive the first derivative from that function, just looking the updating of knowledge. Where does it increase? And then you get a, an average, you see, and initially the people learn quite a bit. Uh, after a while, uh, that's even associated to the three syllables, these three bumps on the average. And then later, there, there's not much more to learn. And again, we use these individual curves as input for our, or as model for our fMRI analysis. And as you can see, uh, the uh, coded nucleus uh, gets uh, activated uh, for this uh, updating of knowledge acquisition. This um, pattern of the angular gyrus, miopifrontal gyrus in knowledge uh, accumulation fits very nicely uh, also with a study uh, Christian Della yesterday already described from uh, Tim Behrens' group. Um, just very briefly, uh, you have these birds and they have different length of necks and legs and uh, associated are these Christmas items. I don't know where they get to that idea, but nevertheless, <laughs> uh, they have this uh, kind of, sp kind of two-dimensional space depending on the length of the neck and the leg, and depending on that, uh, different Christmas items are associated. And then they used the method uh, Christian developed for looking for the uh, grid cells in the, in the entorhinal cortex, and uh, as supported, uh, but yesterday Christian, uh, th therefore I kept it in, he just showed the medial temporal lobe and he uh, didn't show the, the medial prefrontal, which is a way stronger effect, therefore I have to show it again. <laughs> um, there's a medial prefrontal and uh, the, it's even the only region that predicted the performance in the task in two different ways of analysis. Um, and uh, the more grid-like the activity pattern is in the medial prefrontal cortex, the better the subject performed in the task of uh, associating the bird with the object. So the medial prefrontal cortex, that's kind of my, my new hobby. And uh, if you look into the um, Leeson literature, then of course you, you think about uh, confabulations. Patients with uh, medial prefrontal lesions usually caused by ruptures of an artery that is uh, down here, and then you have large holes in the brain. And uh, these patients, one of their symptoms, they have many cognitive symptoms, one is confabulation, so the control of memory retrieval is impaired in these patients. That might uh, make a, a hint towards what this region does. Another piece of uh, uh, lesion data, actually unrelated to, uh, initially unrelated to mebifrontal cortex, are the so-called developmental amnesia. Farah Kadem and colleagues published already almost 20 years ago this paper describing three patients who had uh, perinatal incidents since when they probably had hippocampal damage and amnesia. Those three individuals tested as young adults or teenagers um, performed normal school. They acquired a language and had normal school performance. So the interesting question is, how can a child that is unable to remember at noon what it had for breakfast uh, acquire all the word knowledge normal children have? They don't, yeah, they have an answer and that, I don't buy that, just to go through the data. Uh, so for example, um, here you see the, the IQs they are pretty normal, in particular this John no? uh, is even a bit above average. And then these are different memory tests, normal controls, and you see that with delay, I missed the legend, sorry, uh, that these patients with delay are very impaired. And also copying these figures, more or less no problem for the normal controls anyhow, but also for the patients is quite good, but with a delay they're unable. So they're really amnesic. But they have acquired all the knowledge. So how does it work? This one is now a bit speculative part of my lecture and we, I have to admit and I will show initial data where we would try to, to confirm that idea but uh, it didn't work. But still, interesting data. Um, the idea is that there appears to be a developmental trajectory of memory or on plasticity in general. 
If you go a clinical facility, if children have a stroke, they can learn almost normally again. It's not like an adult stroke if, or a tumor, whatever. There's a big difference in how the brain can recover from brain damage the younger the children is as compared to adults. So there's a humongous difference in uh, uh, plasticity. Language acquisition. The younger you are, the easier it is to acquire a new language. It gets progressively harder. The word knowledge acquisition, there's discussion. Perhaps it's well organized to have all the formal education when you are young. But there's quite some good literature in the social science about attitudes, biases and stereotypes. They are very stable if you have them once acquired during childhood. But then you can acquire them uh, very well. Same with skills. All the skills you learn in childhood are very stable later on. To acquire a new skill later on is way more difficult. Just to imagine learning a music instrument is a big difference between children and adults. So somehow, somehow there's more plasticity during childhood as compared to adulthood. So it's kind of a window of plasticity. So how could we think about it? My hypothesis is that the knowledge acquisition actually it's best the younger you are, because you have to learn everything uh, from scratch. Eh? That the day-night cycle, whatever. Eh? But you learn that just without any effort. Eh? And, and later on, uh, to learn a second job or whatever, it gets progressively harder. And the episodic memory is flat in those patients. That's the idea I have. To test that, we investigated children in the scanner. We used a kind of a schema task to test knowledge that is kind of uh, linked to children. Eh? We took the classical memory card game. Children had to learn the location of objects in this grid, of course, on the screen. And there were two different grids. One was a stable one, the congruent one, and the other was the incongruent. Initially, on the first day, they learned 50% of the items on the grid. Trial and error, trial and error. Quite an effort. And a second one where the location of these items would change all the time. So they couldn't learn anything. And then that was further uh, trained over several days. And then on day four, they learned the second half of items. So 50% of the cards were still unknown, they were not turned. But then suddenly they had to learn the second half of the items. And the idea was that it was way easier for them to learn them if they had the well congruent or schema board before, because then it was a stable schema they have developed of the board, where was which item, so they could, for example, learn there's the cup, and if they have to learn that one, they can relate that to the cut, cup and so forth. In the no schema condition, they couldn't do that. And then on the day five, all the people came into the scanner and were investigated. We had uh, here first the behavior. You can see nicely they learn the stable uh, board nicely. And the other one, during the day, they learn because during the day is stable. But then they go back to baseline. And uh, they had a very hard time for the incongruent one. And then the second half of items, when they were introduced, they were better for the ones that were related uh, to the blue one and worse one to the red ones. So the new schema, new pedersis were better remembered. And we had three groups of uh, uh, participants. One were kind of uh, elementary school children, six to eight. Uh, then we had adolescents, exactly 18, and then adults later. 17 was so difficult, legally. So therefore, we, that was already a nightmare with the children. But then we decided starting with 18 is making things so much easier. The interesting thing there is that uh, the, uh, the activation during the retrieval for the schema new appears is nicely the angular gyrus and the medial prefrontal cortex as well. And uh, the schema benefit was mainly related to the activity in the angular gyrus, but independent of age, as you can see here. There was no age effect. Uh, I missed the behavior, sorry. Uh, the memory for the children was um, a bit worse than the adolescents and adults. But there, the schema effect was the same in all three groups. No if age effect, unfortunately. And also here, you can see the three different colors are scattered over the, uh, the cloud. 
uh, indicating that there is no age effect. The more you activate this region, the more is your schema benefit. But still, there was interesting uh, things done. And this is uh, very new data and probably too complex to understand, but I try. Um, uh, because not really, we just made the uh, HBM abstract about it. Uh, deadline was today or yesterday. Um, and uh, so it was a tour de force in the end to analyze the data. So this uh, PhD student, Niels Müller, he is quite interested in the default mode network um, and uh, how cognitive processes are either in line with the default mode network or um, they uh, disengage with the default mode network. And um, what he did is a multiple regression analysis and this is a time course of activity and you see here for the default mode network a typical deactivation during the task. But uh, if you look into separate the mu prefrontal cortex from uh, the default mode network, then you see that the schema pertussis are not going down as uh, the others. And therefore, there's already a small effect. But if you separate that this way, uh, then you have a, a big effect. Somehow, the mu prefrontal cortex disengages from the uh, default mode network in the retrieval of schema pertussis. And independent of age. And uh, this disengagement actually predicted the performance um, across subject in the memory task in general. And there was an opposite effect in the parapocampal gyrus. So uh, this is the first hint. Um, it's not fully analyzed yet, but what we uh, indicate with this dissociation is that those subjects that have very good performance uh, are those that are able to activate the mere prefrontal cortex and deactivate the parapocampal these are the best for the schema memory retrieval. So that they use the schema uh, memory system in the immune frontal cortex the best. So said that, I would like to uh, close and then I, we came too fast and we can discuss. Uh, uh, yeah? Could I just ask a question on that then before you make your conclusions? <clears throat> so if they're performing better, then maybe they're getting more reward. They feel it's easier, they feel they're doing better. So could that explain the pre-genual singular bits? In other words, it may not be specifically involved as a memory retrieval or whatever mechanism. I agree. It might just be reflecting uh, the fact that their performance is better and they're feeling better about it. In that task, yes. In the sleep task, I have trouble with that um, uh, interpretation. And uh, in, the, in the remote memory, which is more difficult, I have even more trouble. Uh, so we find it for the, the more difficult condition, and we find it for the easier condition. And therefore, the, the, the task difficulty, reward, uh, or decision-making difficulty, interpretation, I have a hard time. But this is saying the performance. This is the correlated with the performance. This one is correlated. I agree. In that, in that case, yes. But not in, in, as a whole. So we have, I have talked about several brain regions. Hippocampus almost ignored after the initial thing. So as I said in the uh, round table, I, I, I lost my faith in the hippocampology um, uh, church. Um, but uh, uh, I'm, uh, the current kind of model we are working with is that the immune prefrontal cortex takes over the binding function for consolidated memories from the hippocampus. Uh, and uh, that this is, as the hippocampus, rather content uh, uh, independent. The caudate nucleus is important for the updating. I didn't show you data for the thalamus. There's animal data, and we have also uh, first hints in, 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 in human data that the medial nucleus of thalamus, like the nucleus reunions, is connecting the mu temporal lobe with the mu prefrontal cortex. It's important for uh, the generalization of memories, which is an important factor for knowledge acquisition because you have to generalize across many incidences. And there's a very nice science paper uh, by uh, Zutov. Uh, the first author has a Xu Xi, some Chinese name I, I don't remember exactly, um, just a two-letter name with an X at the beginning. Um, and uh, they very nicely show that in, in, in the animal model, and we have also some human data on that. And then the content-specific 
schema representation or knowledge um, at the kind of conceptual level that integrates the, uh, the visual input or the other uh, perceptual input is uh, um, represented in the angular gyrus. So in general we think that these two memory systems are kind of in a balance all the time. If you have information that is, uh, uh, that is very novel, perhaps uh, emotionally charged, um, then you uh, activate more your mu tempo lobe and you develop a classical episodic memory. You can remember these salient events very well. Uh, you can travel in your mind back to that event and describe all kinds of details. Um, but in case you acquire an, uh, uh, more knowledge, factual information, uh, or you develop that in your head yourself, uh, that is linked in particular to your pre-existing knowledge, at least if you are adult, uh, this information is highly assistive. It's not kind of simple semantic item memory. Uh, then uh, the mu prefrontal cortex appears to play an important role. And um, uh, with that said, I would like to uh, go on with kind of for my um, uh, future experiments. Um, I'm looking into this uh, interaction because the mu prefrontal cortex is uh, the a neocortical region that develops fully the latest. Eh? Uh, it's kind of the, um, uh, in, the in men up to the mid uh, 20s, it's not fully developed. And uh, the interesting fact is that patient, these uh, uh, patients with developmental amnesia, uh, they fail at university, although they're very good at high school they fail at university. So they cannot acquire new concepts or new schemas anymore when their uh, mu prefrontal cortex is fully developed. That's my idea. Just a spec pure speculation. Um, and, uh, but this is uh, the basis for the hypothesis for, for future grant proposals. Uh, the idea is that uh, initially the mu temporal lobe is actually not that well working uh, when children are very small and you are more and more dependent on the root via the mu temporal lobe and systems consolidation to get something into the mu prefrontal cortex. And if you are young, you are very well able to encode already during the mu prefrontal cortex. Initial evidence is lacking, uh, but we are working on that. And uh, uh, that is the, the hypothesis. So with that said, I would like to, of course, now uh, test you again. The experiment was a two hour experiment. And um, uh, now I will show you uh, four faces. Was it phase one? No. Phase two? Yes. You see, your brain has changed. <laughs> Thank you.